I just wanted to welcome all of you here today. And, and I have spent about the last 20 minutes or so visiting with Barack and sort of challenging him and, and uh, uh, testing him. And I can tell you, he knows what he's talking about. So basically, I lived in uh, uh, Libya during the revolution. Uh, I spent the whole time in Benghazi, and then I moved over to Tripoli when the capital fell. And later, I was able to travel all over the Gaddafi, uh, the loyalist uh, territories. Uh, what I want to do today is I want to start by giving a brief overview of the revolution. And I want to move to the, the challenges that these two countries face, and then uh, the hopes uh, in the f for the future. So the, basically, what, what we saw in uh, Libya was that the uh, protest, the Arab Spring protests in Tunisia and Egypt, uh, influenced uh, the Libyans. On February 17th, they organized protests outside a courthouse in Benghazi. Within days, the protests spread throughout eastern Libya, and Gaddafi lost half of his country. He was able to regroup his forces and capture most of the territory in the west, but he was never able to dislodge uh, the, the rebels from the east. The rebels uh, were based here. They started in Benghazi. Within days, he lost Baida and Tobruk and Darna as well. Uh, they moved as well all the way into here, into Ajdabia, before the uh, Gaddafi forces pushed them out. Um, the National Transitional Council, which uh, with the rebel political body, was formed um, within a couple weeks after the uh, protest started. <clears throat> it was led by dissidents, uh, civil society activists, and defectors from the regime. Uh, it had territory and it had a lot of popularity. Its leader, Mustafa Abdullah, is a former um, minister of justice under Gaddafi. He was very popular. Everybody in society knew him. Um, NATO got involved when the rebels couldn't... Uh, Dislodge when the rebel uh, advance stopped and the loyalists moved uh, east, but uh, they really couldn't. Uh, the, the the NATO the NATO bombings we thought that really quickly that the regime would fall. That didn't happen, so they had to escalate. They moved first brought in military uh, intelligence officers, and they brought in French helicopters, and finally they uh, needed Qatari uh, weapons supplies. What happened is over time, the, there was a stalemate uh, here between uh, Ajdabi and Brega. I spent a lot of time in March and April here. And focus shifted into the Western Mountain, into Misrata over here, which was dislodged. Uh, they were able to dislodge uh, their forces, the Loyalist forces. And here in Zintan, in, uh, in, the, in the Western Mountains. Um, and then in September, the, uh, they, they moved in. There was airlift of weapons in here. And they moved into Tripoli here. And within uh, a couple days, the regime fell. Now, after the regime falls, you have a new government, and we have to look at the future challenges and how, and how they can solve them. Basically, there were a number of problems in, uh, in the Qaddafi regime. He had what was called a uh, people power. Um, basically, Qaddafi created a re uh, regime called people power to where Jamahariya state of the masses. It's where the, he said the people controlled everything. The workers took over the factories. Uh, Qaddafi declared only, a man could only own one house. So people took over other people's houses. Uh, revolutionary activists took over embassies. The question is, why did Gaddafi do this? Basically, he wanted to, he wanted to uh, mobilize the people to get involved in his revolutions. And he saw that they weren't doing that. So early on, he thought that the, his problem was the bureaucracy, that he would, he would in initiate plans, and the plans would go awry in the, democracy, in the bureaucracy. So what he did is he wanted to bypass it. First, he tried to fight the, uh, the bureaucracy. One example was he thought they weren't doing anything all day. So he thought if he removed their tables and desks, they'd get to work instead of drink coffee and uh, read the newspaper all day. He came to the, one of the ministries a couple months later and just found them all sitting on the ground reading the newspapers and drinking coffee. That didn't do anything. So he dismantled the state over time. He dismantled ministries. He created informal authority. All state institutions were gradually destroyed in Libya. And I think in about 1986, the central bank stopped publishing annual reports. There's no transparency. Nothing that we would think about in any uh, uh, Western society existed in this government uh, uh, institutions. So what we see is um, that uh, there's, there's no transparency. Governments don't publish annual reports. A lot, uh, a lot of government uh, agencies don't publish reports. Uh, a reformer that worked with the uh, rebels first prime minister, Mahmoud Jibril, told me, Libya is a black box. You just can't see inside. You don't know what's there. Um, the government also has, the workers have no technical capacity. 
they haven't been trained. Even in the oil industry, which is the lifeline of the economy, uh, the people, uh, uh, Libyans who want to work for foreign oil companies have to be retrained. They just don't have the, qual the qualification and skills. Libya has no uh, experience with pluralistic democracy. Parliament was dissolved under the monarchy in 1965. In 1972, Gaddafi passed a law that made it uh, treasonous to be involved in any political activity. Informal revolutionary bodies have always trumped formal authority. The government is based more on personal relationships than institutional ones. The bureaucracy can't make any decisions, it can only implement them. Um, uh, that, those are the problems under Gaddafi. Added to that, we have the post-revolutionary tremors. Basically what happened is, throughout the, the, throughout the country, uh, militias sprouted up everywhere where the rebels were and they were informal networks of, of people in neighborhoods and they they raided arms depots and they, they they led the fight against the loyalists now what happens is you have to demobilize these militias and you have to reintegrate them into society the, they want they want a few things they want jobs they want job training they want houses they want monthly payments and the government it just isn't in a position to do that right now it has so many problems overarching problems that it can't really focus on retraining them it, it's having tr trouble sending them abroad for for medical care that some of these people that were wounded need and basically these these militias who are disgruntled have the guns and the weapons to take the, their problems to the street if what to vent their frustrations so that's one of the problems we have also because of that we have no central security forces we hear about the creation of a libyan national army but that's being thwarted it's being thwarted both by the militias and within members elements of within the national transitional council who don't want to see the development of these formal institutions the next problem we see in libya is uh, prov provincial marginalization, and this goes back to the early days of uh, the Libyan state, which was created in 1951. On the eve of independence, uh, as you can see, these were the populations of each province. You can see Serenik and Fizan are massive provinces, but they don't have even half the population of Tripolitania. The problem was that Serenik, the, 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 the elite in Libya at that time, and the known leader were, were all based in Serenica. It was a Serenica-based uh, aristocracy and leadership. And they were ready for independence, and they didn't want to take on Tripolitania. They didn't think that Tripolitania was ready, A. And B, they were scared because Tripolitania has 800,000 uh, citizens, and Serenica only had 200,000. So what they devised was they devised a plan of federalism. They would divide the parliament equally. Each province would have the, no the same number of... Uh, of uh, members, and Parliament would move between uh, between Tripoli and Benghazi. They were they were the two capitals, and the king, King Idris, basically <clears throat> just stayed in 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 Serenica. He didn't really come to Tripolitania a lot. So what happened is the regi the the revolution starts as we said in Serenica, and the NTC most of its members are from from the eastern uh, areas of Serenica. Mustafa Abjilil. Also, the the chairman of the council. He's also from he's uh, from Beida, which is in Serenica. And then so, over time, when the capital falls, everybody moves to Tripoli because that's where all the government uh, institutions are, all, all the ministries. Serenica believes that it's going to be marginalized. So what happens? You have this call for federalism again that existed under the monarchy. They want to recreate this federalism. There is a latent threat that federalism could lead to a dissolving of the state or, or, or long-term security problems in the state. So that's a big problem that we're going to see. When we talk about the Libyan state, and we're not only talking about the Libyan state today, we're talking about from when the colonization of the Phoenicians and the Greeks started in the 8th century BCE through the Arab invasions of the 650s, 640s and 650s. You have a split in, in Libya between the coastal areas where most of the population lives and the hinterland, the interior, which is the, the, the Saharan desert down here. Invaders have, have traditionally been able to control this area, but not extend their authority into the provincial areas. This, this, this was the, the case with the Arabs, it was the case with the Turkish, the Ottomans who ruled until the, the, uh, the 20th century, 1911 when the Italians came in. This was mostly the case with the Italians until the 1930s, the fascist, when Mussolini came to power and he pushed south. What you're gonna see, and, and what we've seen here is in the last couple months in Sebha, and in Kufra, which is, these are these are distant, massive distances from the central uh, regions up here, you've seen uh, uh, fighting and killing between uh, disgruntled tribes. 
basically what we're going to see now is a weak central state, which can maybe control the, the central, the, the coast, coastal areas, not be able to project authority into the hinterlands. The hinterlands is where all the oil production comes from. The oil production isn't here on the, in the coastal areas. It's down here. And for people that are such as you guys who are all oil, oil guys, you have to think about attacks against pipelines over the long term if there's any instability. Okay, so that is something that uh, we need to keep in mind. We've talked about the challenges to Libya. Let's talk about the hopes. Uh, Libyans are a very patient people. They're, they, you see every other day in Egypt, there's protests, there's riots. They're, 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 they're mad at the, the, the military rulers for one reason or another. You don't really see this in Libya. They're, they're patient. Libyans really just want two things. They want their monthly salary from the government, about 75% of Libyans, uh, of the workforce, uh, is on the government payroll. And they want the social welfare state that they've come to expect. The government subsidizes everything from the cradle to the grave. As I, as, as I was shocked to learn, I, I met people in Libya who had American cars, and I asked them how much they pay for the car, because I'm all, always interested in what kind of taxes you have. The cars cost less, the American cars cost less in Libya than they do here because they're subsidized by the government. These governments, and throughout the Middle East, our governments are always subsidizing basic staples such as bread and flour to keep their populations in line. In Libya, they subsidize everything. And this is what the, the people want. They just want the, the, their social welfare networks. <laughs> Libyans really don't expect a lot from their leaders. They, they never really understood their political system that they had, the Jamaharia. So we're not going to see the same type of demands that we see in the, a lot of the other countries, Arab countries that had uh, revolutions. Um, they know their country is facing major challenges and they're going to be very patient about that. Unlike Egypt, which is hemorrhaging uh, foreign currency, Libya is not because it has a lot of oil. Libya produced about 1.65 million barrels of oil before the revolution. Its all-time high was in 1970, 1770, I think it was uh, 3.3 uh, million barrels of oil a day. And basically, they reduced over time the number of uh, their oil production because they thought that their oil production was running out. But over time, they discovered that uh, they have more and more oil. They more doubled their proven reserves since they started cutting back on oil production. The long-term problems in the oil industry is infrastructure. They, you had sanctions from 92 to 98 that prevented, uh, associated with the Lockerbie bombing, prevented the import of, uh, of new heavy uh, machinery and uh, uh, oil infrastructure. And even when the sanctions were lifted, the, 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 the government, is so, the bureaucracy is so bloated and so inefficient that they didn't, couldn't bring in the stuff uh, that they needed. Um, to, to rebuild the oil industry. So you had uh, the NOC, National Oil Corporation, uh, senior executives saying, oh, we want to get to two million barrels a day within five years. And they never got that. This was the beginning of the, la uh, of the, of the, of the millennium. They never got to there. So they're at 1.65. They'd like to be able to get to two million. But again, they have these oil infrastructure problems. Um, uh, uh, Libya will not need aid, foreign aid, as a country like them that we're going to talk about because it has oil. And they're only going to need technical expertise from the international community to help them build an independent justice system, transparent institutions. And unlike Iraq, uh, the whole international community is behind the project in Libya because the, the Western, po the European powers are at the forefront of this. This was not an American operation. It was Sarkozy, uh, for French President Nicolas Sarkozy, uh, who led the charge, and, and uh, uh, British Prime Minister David Cameron, and the Italians also. The Italians have a major stake in, in, in uh, Libya because most of their oil and natural gas comes from Libya. Any of the Italian uh, producer, I think the number is they produce about 17% of their oil comes out of Libya. It's, a, it's a very important for them. Not only one way, but the other way. Libya invests a lot in Italy. So Italy has a massive stake in making sure that Libya gets back on track.